It's Thursday morning in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Thursday, Thursday, Thursday. Welcome it's, aboard. It's May 13th, the year 2021. And what is this? Podcast 477. And? And, and? and it's a beautiful day and you're awesome. What? I don't know. I was what? just trying to lead you into and this is the <laughs> Crushing Iron Podcast. <laughs> and this podcast. is the Crushing Iron Podcast, episode 477. Yeah, we didn't. We missed that one. It is. It is a absolutely... Gorgeous, and it has been this whole entire week. I feel like gorgeous morning here in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Um, it's been beautiful. Next it has week, been. It's gonna get hot. It's gonna get <laughs> a little bit toasty. <laughs> You're welcome for my Monday <laughs> prediction. Uh, but see, a lot can change in the next in the next uh, ten days. Sleet, practically. I, that's right. I did predicted <laughs> sleet and parkas. Uh, maybe even some, uh, you know, the old grocery bag trick that we pull out, but we appreciate you tuning in and we hope you're having an awesome week so far. Again, this is the crushing iron podcast. We are at episode 477. We appreciate you tuning in and giving us your time. We know you have a lot of options in the triathlon podcast universe and just podcasts in general. Your time is valuable. So we appreciate you giving us that. We cover it all. We cover uh, swim, bike, run specific training. We'll do race recaps. We'll do a lot of race previews, have on the occasional guest. uh, for, sometimes we'll hop into our Facebook group as we did about five minutes ago. Uh, that's Crushing Iron Group on Facebook. If you want to be, be a part of that awesome community, lots of great people in there. you got people who have never even done a triathlon, two people who have won races, uh, professional athletes, everyone in between. It's a really awesome, supportive community and just awesome people in general. It's like I was reading it this morning because I don't even know that it was titled that. I'm sure you did it, but the, the kind of description of the group is like, people who are trying to get better at triathlon and at life. And that, that's a, that's like the easiest way to sum up, I think our community and, and the po- hopefully our podcast. Oh, is that in what general. it says? But yeah. I think, I mean, you did that. Obviously I didn't do that. Yeah. Um, wow. you know, like six years ago, I guess. <laughs> so, um, but you, we'll hop in there like we did today and just kind of see what the pulse of the community is. And, and it's, it's all over the place right now because everyone's kind of like back to racing and it's, that was, we referenced this on our, our weekly call yesterday with our athletes that we do. Um, that again, it's one of the other, I think, huge positives that came out of like the pandemic COVID times. It was like we, we now do like a weekly Zoom call with our athletes and cover different things. And I was like, yeah, it was like, hey, you know, Texas got canceled. And then everyone was like, oh, the whole year is going to be gone and no one's going to race again. It was like and then overnight. It was like business as usual. And it is awesome. And we are uh, super pumped to have everybody, not everybody, but most of you, a lot of you come in town next weekend for Chattanooga 70.3. Uh, come by the hub, come see us. We'll be all over the course cheering. We'll have uh, three of our coaches here. The other one's going to be racing. Another one can't make it, but we will be on course cheering you on. Come by the hub and see us. That's uh, 1603 Fagan Street, uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37408. Come see us. Come say hi. We'll be basically open for business with the garage doors open, the outdoor uh, our back turfed patio, as I would consider calling oh, it, yeah. wide open. Uh, I was out some there cornhole hanging some out. Core yeah, work. it's uh, gonna be gonna be an awesome time. So come by and see us Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whatever. Uh, come see us, and we'll see you in the race course on Sunday. And if you want to come by on Sunday evening around four or five o'clock until Mike decides to close the place down and wants to go to bed. Come by for the after party, BYOB. Uh, but come see us. We're pumped to see you. Um, the kind of our de facto 14-month late grand opening that we were planning on having last year when the whole world basically stopped. But, hey, we kept pushing forward, and here we are. We uh, had it, but nobody was here. We did. It was just you and I. We, we I, I went to <laughs> Welcome. Wal- I went to the Walgreens party aisle and picked out a ribbon, and we stood outside of the hub, and we both cut it together with, you know, a zero fanfare. Yeah. Um, the Chamber of Commerce was like, would you like to do a ribbon cutting? We're like, we already did that. We're covered. Yeah. With our polos, with our with our polos, you, uh, yeah. So come on in here; it's going to be cool. And like I said, I will, um, I take will be. Selfies. If you've been, <laughs> I'll take selfies. <laughs> and if if you've been thinking about, uh, this would be a great time to interact. If you've been thinking about coaching in the future, you can interview me and grill me under the hot light. <laughs> we do. Well, see I'm, what's I'm, I'm bringing one in. You think I'm kidding? But we're going to have gonna like two sit chairs in the corner and, and just be pelted with. Tough questions. Yeah. And I'll, let me just say this. And I think pretty most people know this if they've met both you and I and, and, you know, in public in real life, Mike's pretty charming. So if you, if you get with it, day, if you get within like a six foot radius, you're in, I'm just going to say it right now. He is, he is charismatic. He's awesome. But yeah, hit him up for coaching. If you're interested, we also have a bunch of camps coming up. Most of them are, well, both our camps in June are sold out. They have been for a while. Uh, but then we also have our, uh, Chattanooga training camp, which is at the um, very end of July, pretty much first week of August. You can go to our website and check that out. C26triathlon.com. Um, and it's for everybody. It's obviously geared towards those that are doing Ironman Chattanooga or, or maybe exploring doing it in a future year because we'll do a lot of core stuff. 
uh, on the course. But for the most part, it's going to be just a heavy, awesome training weekend. So it, it'd even be good for those of you that are doing like a late season 70.3. It's already 50% full. So hop on there, check that out. Um, and then obviously the rest of the things we're doing are on our website with additional coaches and just a lot of things. We just have a lot of things going on our hands and a lot of pie, a lot of pies and a lot of pots. Um, but we got a lot of help. A lot of pies and a lot, a lot, of, lot pots. of pies and a lot of pots. Uh, um, can I just say real quick that oh boy. <laughs> we're looking ahead at, uh, you know, I've lived here about a year now, a little under a year. And I'm, have you noticed how windy it is around here? No. Okay. Well, I have. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just throwing that out there. Okay. Compared like, to Nashville, it's and not my neighbor windy. actually said it's, it's windier than usual this year. So just be prepared I mean, it's, for it's, heat and wind. It's spring. <laughs> I mean, like, it's always windier in spring. I mean, I feel like that's oh, pretty is that much. Why? Yeah. I mean, it's, I feel like that's volatile that's weather. Pro- I mean, I've lived, in, I've lived, Nashville is a lot windier than people think. And then I've also lived in Kansas City. So I've lived some pretty windy places. Yes, you have. Yeah. Not Chicago, but that, I've lived here and I, you know, I can tell you it's not that windy. All right. That's all I got. You ready to roll? Yeah, let's roll. So hop into our Facebook group again if you want to be a part of that. Uh, hop in there. Um, Crushing Iron Group answering a simple question. But this morning I popped in and said, you know, hey, what are you guys feeling? What are you guys thinking about? Because if you don't have anything, you know, then Mike and I will do our usual very strict outline podcast segment, um, you know, that we'll go through that we've been using, been prepping for for like the last three days, you yeah. know, to, to execute to the best of our abilities. Um, but, you know, today we figure we'll be flexible and just kind of shoot off the cuff and go with what the, uh, with kind athletes. of alive, kind of alive. Yeah. I wish we do this all the time. This is my favorite. Um, David Magnet, uh says the taper discuss the taper. Um, and man, like we've, listen, we, we've discussed this a lot. Like we, I'm not going to go too far into this because, you know, frankly, we've got 476 other podcasts that we kind of touch on it, uh, touch on it, but it's a good question because you've got athletes racing this week. And I think just generally speaking, and, and you may, you probably have a different take on this, but to me, the taper is like people way overthink the taper and all people overthink the taper. They're too strict with the taper. And then on the other end of the spectrum, people are way too effing lazy when they taper. Like the, when people see, when athletes see the word taper, they, they, I feel like they see and hear time to take days off, time to eat what I want and time to get lazy. It's not, it's time really to get fresh. I think they see donuts and pizza. I, I did. I'm the same way. They're like, oh, it's carb load, baby. You're 10 days out. Stop carb loading. Like, um, it's about getting crisp. Right. And it's like, so I'll give an example. Like we're about what, 10, nine, 10 days out from the athletes that we have that are doing Chattanooga 70.3. Um, and, and right now a common feeling you should have is my cardio feels like I'm ready to roll. Like I'm feeling really good. My RPE is a little bit lower than normal. Um, I, I'm just feeling really fit and fresh. My legs, however, they're just not there yet. And you know what? That's perfectly fine because you don't want them there yet, right? If it's a, it's a, if it's a well-timed taper, you should unload a good bit and then you should feel pretty spry by like the weekend before where you can still kind of pop things. So you want to, you want to stay crisp. You want to still keep some tension. You want to get lazy and, and, and stretched out and just kind of stale. Like a lot of athletes going to races totally stale. You don't, you want to have some pep in your stuff. And uh, I, I think a lot of athletes look at taper just way too um, lax and lazy. And the point is it to feel called crisp. the lead in or something. Not. Yeah. The it's, yeah. It's what well, it should be. It should be called peaking. Like it should not be called tapering. It should be called, you know, getting ready to getting ready to rip it. Like, and if you want to do that, you don't go into things lazy. Like think of it this way. Like if you're going to go do pretty much anything else in life, and you want to perfect it and use all the things that you've done really, really well, you know, like you're getting ready for like a big exam or a test. Like you don't want to over cram and stay up all night because you don't need to. Like you've done all the work, but you just want to refine. Maybe look over a few things that you haven't, you're not really super comfortable. But you want to be rested, you want to be ready, but you all still want to stay sharp. And that's the point, you know, it's like, you don't want to, you know, go through and have to cram and, and read 400 pages, but and you want to take out some flashcards and be like, boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom. You just know them. You're crisp. You're ready to roll. Um, and that's how taper should be, should feel. You, you, if you're two weeks out, because honestly, most a lot of people don't do enough training and enough volume to deserve a two-week taper for a 70.3. It should really be like five or six days. Um, however, a lot of people um, you know, should. So, yeah, it's about crisp. Don't get too lazy. Um, and when in doubt, sleep in. You know, if you can basically like two weeks out, listen, mess up your routine, turn your alarm off and let your body tell you what time it is to wake up or your kids, or your spouse, whatever, but sleep in, enjoy yourself and be flexible with your schedule. Like, ah, I think I need to move, then move it like flex, be flex. Uh, I had a good question from an athlete about this and I'm never, I'm never really quite sure 
how to answer it, but um, he asked, should I reduce calories because I'm not burning as many? Or like, how do I handle this as far as eating? Do you have thoughts on that? Because um, I, I, my th- gut thought is you don't want to just like, I think you want to eat and build up, I don't know, stores, but I don't know if you have a, a better, more clear answer on something like that. I don't ever, well, I mean, like, I think one of the the mindset shifts you have to do, and this is also like super common with just Ironman training in general, is a lot of people do still like overeat, right? It's like they, they think, oh, I'm training a ton. I need to eat a ton, which a lot of people do, but a lot of people like you see, you actually see, and I know I work a lot of it too, like they're like, I'm gaining weight during Ironman training because you just assume that you need to like, you know, triple every single you know bit of and you, you you do but not to but it's all usually about like what you're eating not you know like i can eat anything i want to which if you want to that's you know it's your show run it but at the same point when you hop into taper you also don't need to restrict calories because your body's repairing it so if you don't want to starve it while it's trying to repair itself and get ready to race you just need to kind of scale things back and really just kind of clean things up in, in my opinion like i don't ever look at reducing calories i just kind of like think well you know am i hungry like did i really do you just have to kind of have that mindset shift. It's like, I, I'm not doing, you know, three and a half hours of training today. I'm doing an hour, you know? So like, do I really need, if I'm doing an hour easy ride, do I really need my post-workout recovery shake? And then do I really need this gigantic lunch that I, you know, that I usually had? Probably not. Yeah. You know, that's why I stick to my, you know, have a ribeye with some brown rice and a half of an avocado. That should be your, that should be your meal every night for the five days leading up to race day. That's what I'm saying. Mm, gets clean. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's clean. That's again, I fat. always think that, you know, one of the things I always try to get in the habit of, and I've talked about this many times, but like there's a, if you're feeling like you're hungry, and I think a lot of times that can come down to boredom um, and you're just sitting around, you feel like snacking or whatever, but I always try to like go, you know, drink a glass of water first and then just see how it feels in 20 minutes. Because a lot of times it is uh, a thing about dehydration or you're thirsty more than you're hungry and it's just confused. It's deceptive. It is very deceptive. Next one, Carrie. Uh, she, when in aero, speed is from power output along with less wind resistance due to body position. Is your power output generally greater in a more upright position because your hip angle is more open? Even if you're not necessarily faster, you can just push more power if your hip angle is more open in the upright position. Graphs, diagrams, calculations, welcome. Yeah, generally speaking, most people can produce way more power sitting up than they can in arrow. Uh, it's all just because of like the, not just your hip angle. It's actually just like the position that you're sitting and how your weight's distributed. Um, the same thing can be said for why you're able to produce so much power when you're standing up, right? It's more force. that's being applied to the pedals by the fact that you're no longer sitting on a seat. That's, you know, um, giving your body something to rest on. It's about force. Uh, so yeah, so it's some people, I, I do know, having said that though, I know a lot of athletes, myself included, who can produce more power in arrow for short periods of time. Um, than I can sitting up just because not for longer, um, but for short periods of time, I can actually produce more power in arrow because my hip angle is, is better. And it's actually able, it, it allows me to get a higher turnover in that position than sitting up. Um, but yeah, most, most all people, most all people, most all, people. most all, m- the majority of athletes can, um, produce more power sitting up. Yes. But then obviously you're sacrificing like an enormous amount of, of not being non arrow Cause you're sitting up and basically catching all the wind. So yeah. as with all things in life, it's a happy medium, be arrow, but also be powerful and kind of find like the happy medium. Yeah. I mean, you're bringing your upper body into it. If you're sitting up I mean that, I mean, that's going to be part of it. Right. I mean, cause your arms and you're, you're just kind of working that more, but like we always talk about, man, it's like find Hills that are manageable and, and work on going up them in arrow. And I think that, cause that's really what you want to be able to do is like, I'm not saying like like steep climbs or whatever always, but those hills that are kind of on the cusp, you know, maybe in the middle, if you can figure out a way to go, you'd be surprised, man. It's like once you get that down and obviously arrow is worth a lot. So even climbing, you know, to some degree, but I think for more, more than that, it's just if you're training and you're working those hills in arrow, that just really makes you a lot stronger in arrow period. That was actually a question down the line from uh, that I was scrolling through. Jen Hale said, and it's to kind of dove, dovetail off another question further up. Is there a benefit from training on hills in arrow versus sitting up or standing if the hill isn't too steep? 100%. Stay in arrow as long as possible. Because again, it's still about, um, you know, 
it's it's still about being arrow and being efficient. And that was something I remember maybe was it three and a half years ago, like when you and I would ride on the trace, you stayed in arrow as long as you possibly could on the rolling hills when you and I would go out and do this like with t- 2018 or something. Um, yes, like if you see like, you know, uh, whether you like him or not, like Brett Sutton has turned out like some insanely great, especially female professional tra- athletes like Daniela Reef, Chrissy Wellington, just to name a few. Um, and if you look at what they do for a majority of the time, like they do a lot of big gear work. And when you see pictures on them outside, they're doing hill repeats and arrow. Uh, not obviously not like super steep because listen, super, super steep hills are so overrated. They're overrated for not just for cycling, but especially in running. Like, oh, the, the steeper the better. No, because you're putting all the pressure on the parts of your on the parts of your body that you don't normally put pressure on. You're probably going to be in the balls of your feet, your calves, your keys are going to explode. And you're not using the normal run economy that you are going to use on a regular race day. So it's it's not counterproductive. It's just not very productive. You know, more isn't always better. But yes, you should be an arrow um, on hills up to a point, right? Um, till you feel yourself slowing down, you know, too much. Then you got to sit up and probably put a little more power. But if it's like a four, four to six to seven percent grade, stay an arrow because it's still about like the least amount of you in the wind versus the most power you can produce to get up it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And just the more you train it, the more it recruits those hill muscles and, and in arrow. And I, I just think that builds your arrow overall. It does. Yeah. You're more, you're, you're better control, you're better power, you're more powerful. Uh, and I think you just get more generally comfortable with it over time. Mm-hmm. And you can set up going down the hill a little bit if you want. Yeah. As long as you can control your bike. Uh, next one thoughts on 10 day weather forecast for Chattanooga. I'm still, I'm sticking with my, I'm sticking with my show. Okay. I'm still saying a low of 59, uh, on race day. I think it's going to be around 80. I think it's gonna be partly cloudy, but again, when I say 80, I'm talking like <laughs> partly, cloudy. I'm talking like two you. o'clock. Now I'm, I'm getting I'm telling you, I'm going all in. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be partly cloudy, uh, which is also code for partly sunny. Uh, cause partly cloudy and partly sunny are the same exact things. I think low in the 59, I think a high around 80, but that won't be around till like one or two. And most of y'all be off the course, man. It's going to be in the seventies, baby. Yeah. The old weatherman, 50% gotcha. every That's time, right. exactly. no matter what you say. Gotcha. You got a forecast for Tulsa, man. While we're mm, at it. I haven't even looked at the Tulsa. Dust bowls. For, yeah. Dust bowls. I'll look that up in a minute. I think next one, uh, I want to, I want to, from Adam, I want to train at my half marathon pace. But expect that it'll be slower in the race, 70.3. I will not be racing with heart rate monitor, so how do I know what pace to really train at? Train in zone two and expect that will feel like zone three in the race. Um, yeah, you know, that's that's a tough one. Like, I don't, you don't know. I think that's the thing, Adam, is like, you don't really know what your half marathon pace is. Like, a lot of people pick that. That's why we, like, whenever we do tempo stuff, so for me, like, in the athletes that we work with, zone three is... Um, is this it's for me zone three and on a run is open half marathon effort not pace effort what it feels like which to me is like a seven or eight out of ten like that's to me what your your marathon your half marathon should feel like in a 70.3 and in an open half marathon now the speeds might be different because an open half marathon you haven't swam and bike beforehand but it should be a feel picking a pace out of nowhere is so i think it's even for like, and I have this conversation all the time with the athletes we have that train for Boston. Like, no, we don't train as, as, at a specific pace. Like you, for me, you either train way under or you train way over. Like there, you shouldn't be hanging out in the gray zone. For a lot of people, that zone three is the gray zone. So I think the first problem there is like training at your half marathon pace, but you don't even know that, right? Because you're training to run it. So you don't even know what that is. It should be, an, it should be something that is effort-based. Um, you know, do a lot of zone three work. That's really just more like sustained um, efforts, which I think people need to practice because it's, it's that like, it's uncomfortable, but it's comfortable enough to do it for a long period of time. And that's the problem with, for, that's the problem for most athletes is like, they're like, this is really uncomfortable and kind of annoying. God damn it. I think I can hold this for a long time. And so mm-hmm. it takes a, I, I, if you've ever gotten a tattoo, I, the great, the best analogy I can give you is that zone three is like what a tattoo feels like. It's annoying. <laughs> It's slightly uncomfortable. It's a little bit painful, but it's just super annoying. And the fact is you can handle it for hours. And that is how zone three should feel. But most people don't like to handle. Like you have people that like, oh, I'd rather go all out for like four or six minutes. And because you can wrap your mind around the brevity of the interval or how long it's going to take. 
Whereas like zone three is sustained overtime. You're like, crap, this is a long time to like focus and dial in and stay present and really push myself to the limit. Um, it's something that needs to be practiced. But I think the, the first thing there is just like, you know, picking your pace. Um, and, and I don't even suggest, I don't even tell our athletes to like go by heart rate us. We just go by RPE for, um, on the run. I think uh, when you think of zones like that, like if you think about like a half Ironman and the marathon run, do you, do you think it's a good like strategy to basically, you know, start in the lower zones and then just sort of build through the zone two and then like hit at a certain point zone three and then just you have to like at the end, if you got something left, let it rip. Is that kind of a, a basic philosophy that you would think about? Or I mean, because, you know, I, 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 always, I always, you know, preface these kind of things with if you're going for the podium, you know, it's, a, it's probably a little bit of a different, you know, strategy out there. But, like, if you want to just have a solid race and you're trying to build a solid race, is, is, is a gradual um, throughout the half a good, you know, baseline to think about? Or is that... It, it raising your effort, yeah. So that's the thing. It's like, you know, a lot, effort. like it's never, for, for most athletes, especially because you don't know what the course is like, it gets really, really, really hard to negative split, right, a race. Um, because you are just so, especially in a 70.3, you're already so fatigued, right? The best races I've ever done have when, and, and the athletes we work with, like it's, it's more of like an even split because what mm -hmm. you want is like, and I think this is the, the common like misconception is like your goal is to start at like a seven or an eight and whatever pace that gives you for the day. Like, let's say you're seven of an, seven out of eight, which is, which is a solid, like purposeful effort. Let's say it's a seven thirty minute mile. Well, the goal isn't then to go from 7.30s to 7.20s. I mean, if you can, good for you. Um, and, and the terrain of the day, and you're just, you got it. But for the most part, it's about raising your effort to maintain the 7.30 or to, or to limit the losses, like, and not make it go from a 7.30 to an 8 or an 8.30, but to go from, like, a 7.30, 7.31, 7.30, 7.34, 7.30, you know, 7.38, 7.30, like to hang around within like a five or 10 second minute. Like that's what you see of the best race that people put on. It's like they all hang within like five or 10 second minute mile, obviously depending on like the train they're going on, the splits they have and where they're kind of located on the, on the, on the run course. It's about keeping an even pace, but, but allowing enough room to raise effort. Right. And that's like, that's the same thing that can be said. Like when I give out prep for, um, for Ironman races, it's like, I want you to start around like a five or a six effort. And then your the goal is to now maintain whatever pace that is for the next 26 miles and not have to get to raising your effort to a nine or a 10 until you get to mile 20. Cause I firmly believe if you can, if you can wait till mile 20 to get, to be at like your nine or 10 to where you're able to run the whole thing and you'll be able to, and you have still have room, right. To lift your, cause most people come flying out of the gate and they're already at an eight and they haven't trained well enough. They haven't run enough and they're running at a, at a pace so much faster than what they're prepared for. And they go from an eight and then they're at like a, ten, a 10 out of 10 effort wise at like mile nine. You've now, how are you going to manage 19 more miles, right? Or 17, two more miles. Like you're, it's way you're not, you know what you have to do? You're gonna have to walk right mm -hmm. to get your RPE. To, it's the same thing. Same thing. When you say coming out too hot, it's same can be except for coming out too hot temperature wise. Like once you get too hot, you can't keep moving, right? In order to cool your core temp down, you have to stop or walk and triage yourself. And be like, all right, I need to get my, my core temp down. So I've got to slow down tremendously. So you, you have to pace it. And most athletes don't give themselves a buffer, but 70.3 for it's, especially from the pointy end, it's like you're coming out of the gate and you're now going to just find the most uncomfortable, comfortable kind of painful effort that I think I can hold for the rest of the race. You know, and give yourself like a mile to get your legs underneath it, but then it's it really is just kind of like painful for the rest of the time. All right. Next up is Ashley. Ash, come on down. If you know you're going to if you know you're going to a race under trained, besides racing smart and enjoying the day, any other suggests from making it as successful as possible? Well, I think you kind of answered your own question there. Um, because I think success is super relative. Um most people, I mean, if we're going to be really honest, which we try to be, most people's level of success way overestimates their previous ability and execution and time management and the amount of training that they did because they, they signed up for a race 12 months ago or with, you know, COVID 20 months ago, 
they had this picture of what they wanted to be. So now they go into race and basically anything less than that is ideal, right? Is like, is less a successful race would be going into it and keeping your perspective and having fun, right? That, that's, that's, I mean, that's, that's the essence of most racing. Like even no matter what end of the spectrum you're on, it's about having fun. It's about executing. It's about, you know, and, and that's like, you don't have to execute a race and be only thinking about performance. You can execute a race that's just based on, I just want to have a fun, keep, keep my wits about me, have a good spirit and leave the race energized, ready to get back going at it again and be like, this race was fun. Like not all races are going to be your, you know, your welcome party or your, your, you know, your, you know, overnight success story for a lot of people, especially this year, it's going to be like, you're reminding yourself how much fun race day is and how much you enjoy being around all these other people and doing these things that are hard and setting an example. And at the same point, why like the amount of pressure we put on them ourselves to perform all the time. And like it, this should be fun, right? And, and just to keep your perspective and, and balance things and to be able to kind of troubleshoot that on your own. Like if that's, if that's what, ha- you know, and, and don't feel like, and let's be honest, don't feel like you have to give your reasons or excuses to everybody else who's there. Well, you know, I haven't done this. And like, who, first of all, people will probably don't care because most travelers don't care about themselves when it comes to race day. Like, Race day is for you, right? You don't owe anybody an explanation. You don't owe anybody your reasons for, you know, having not being able to train or not having the motivation or energy to train because life got in the way. That's part of life. And as long as you can go out there and enjoy the ride, then who cares what anybody else thinks? Yeah. And and training, <clears throat> being undertrained is, we see it all the time. It's like, you know, people will do that. They'll undertrain and then, you know, maybe let's say, three weeks out from an Ironman, they're going to be like, you know, the longest ride they did was maybe three hours, four hours max. And then they go out one weekend and go like seven or something like that, just to kind of prove it. And, you know, it, for me, it always seems like everybody always proves it. So my point is always like, if you can do that three weeks before a race or four weeks or whatever, save it till race day, you know, because you and, and, and what you're just saying about effort, I think you need to apply that on the bike as well and in the swim. So it's like, don't burn your bike effort all the way to the wall. I mean, there's been plenty of Ironman races where, you know, you've seen me. I mean, like I, I, I hate riding long a lot of times and I've gone in, you know, t- you know, technically under trained or whatever. But as far as like distance and, uh, you know, you just suck it up or whatever. But you have to pay attention to effort big time because if you're thinking you're going to go out there and really race 112 miles, if, but you've only ridden like 70 or 80, you really got to be careful because, you know, again, it's sort of that thing where, you know, if you, if you give up 20 minutes on the bike, you know, you might be able to get 25 or 30 back on the run if you play it smart. But if you go out and try to just prove that bike and then it could turn into a disaster on the run. So I just think it's all about, maintaining control and try not trying to be somebody you're not um we've all seen it you know like if you can ride four hours you can certainly suck it up for a few more a couple more you know if you just pace it right and everything like that it's just going to be painful on your butt probably because you're not used to it or whatever but it's all about like you're saying man have fun with it and not sweat a few minutes here and there on the bike just because you're not you know hitting your you know your the speed that you think you can hit or something like that. It's like, you know, race day is always different. You know, you can think, you can think it through all the way you want, but if you get out of that swim a little bit exhausted, that bike is not going to be like your other, you know, standalone bike rides. No, it's not. So just, just be cautious. And like you're saying, smile and have fun and watch your effort from the get go. Cause no one's ever gotten off the finish their day and been like, dude, I, I saved it too much on the bike. <laughs> Telling you, like I, I, I could have taken. I mean, I, I knew I should have pushed those last thirty miles. Like I have way too much energy left. No one's ever said that. Uh, next question uh, from Daniel: Thoughts on bike cleats and power? Is there a different? Is there a different power output in two, three, four bolt? Pe- no. Like file, uh, Daniel. I love you. File this under way overthinking things that really don't matter. Um, Doug, I'd be curious to hear a more in-depth conversation to your reply on another comment about the ability to improve speed over years of consistent work. It's easy to find the stories of athletes jumping into the racing and finding early success, but hearing more of the middle of the pack to front of the pack over five to 10 years aren't as common. Um, it's a great question. And it's a, it is a long lengthy, 
you know, answer, you know, there is another athlete who posted in the, in our closed group the other day about like, you know, what should I expect, you know, to see over a certain amount of years going from like 13 miles an hour to like 15 to 18. And I think the first problem is that word. What should I expect? Expect You shouldn't expect anything. You should expect nothing, right? Because you have no idea, right? Like I had, I had a, new, a new athlete call or an inquiry the other day. I was like, you know, what, you know, where do you think I can be? And like, zero idea, no clue, zero. You don't know your body. I don't know your body. We have no idea. Not only do we not know, right, how your body's going to respond to, you could be a minimal dose guy, which if you are, congratulations, awesome. If you're not, you're a volume guy like me, unfortunately, then we don't know because if you're a volume guy, right, and you're uh, and you're a single dad of three kids with a demanding job, like that's those don't go well together, right? So it's probably going to take you longer to get to where you want to be, right? Um, or you're, you know, versus like being the the counter to that is like you know being you know a single guy or girl with a nine to five job and you know no responsibilities. You're a volume person, boom! Like you can probably see a lot of a whole lot of improvement in a very short period of time if you're consistent with it. On the other side, you know, you got a person who's a minimal dose person and has a busy life. It can still work, right? Because they're a minimal dose person. The thing is, you just don't know, right? And the other thing that I've, I've come to learn and from coaching the last 15 years is that like people's definition of consistent is very different, mm-hmm. right? Like people expect to, you know, make like leaps and bounds of improvement off of like one or two sessions a week. And that's not just how any of this works. Like, even if you're a minimal dose person, there has to be a dose and that's not even a dose. So, you know, to what to expect is you're already, you're already putting yourself on the ball because you're expecting something. And, and the, the example that I gave, I think this is the one that, that Doug is referencing to is I always go back to like it, my, I did Gulf coast was my very first 70.3. And my, the first one I did was in like the, the low six hour range. It was like six thirteen or six twelve or something like that. And then the last one I did six years later, I worked my way all the way down to be in the four thirties. Um, and it took me six years. Now, having said that, that was also weren't six years of like uninterrupted training. Like there was still plenty of interruptions that went on. There wasn't like three sixty five day in and day out training. But I still think it's like a it's a chipping away kind of curve, right? And I think and I've never like I think that's also like what helps me out as a coach is like I'm not one of these athletes that can just like wake up and be awesome overnight, which some people can. They just have that. Um, but the reason you don't say that kind of what Doug referenced to is like you don't have you know, here's many of those stories, you know, of people coming back for you know, of this amount of success for like five or ten years. And well, the reason you don't do that is because people become disinterested, right? Because we live in a world where people want instant gratification, instant success. And uh, to be frank, like, I think people have become, especially like at type A athletes feel entitled that they should have an enormous amount of improvement in a very short period of time because they see everything advertised now as shorter, shorter. Everything's getting shorter. Everything is getting shorter. All the promises you see are getting shorter. And like no one advertises like, hey, two and a half years to your best 70.3 call me like that, that's yeah. not the way people work you know it's like or you know uh you know six hours to your best marathon or it's all it's always less everyone sells less less time less effort you know and more you know more gains that's what people sell we don't sell that shit because it's stupid and it doesn't work and it might feel like it works for like two seconds like crash dieting or detoxing ah dude, I lost like 12 pounds in three hours. Yeah. You were on the toilet for basically three days straight. And all you had was a raisin and a coconut. What did you expect? (laughs) And then what happens? They end up putting on like 20 pounds. Like that's why those things are marketable because people want the short term. That's not what we do. And if you're an athlete bars, you know, it's like we, you know, we are consistent. We do all the boring work we need to do. We spice it up sometimes, but for the most part, that's what we do. And you get better over long periods of time because that, that also makes it sustainable. So that's why you don't hear a lot of those stories. Um, but again, it's, it's, it's a cons- being consistent is relative. It also, when you use that, when you use the word expect, you also, not only are you just kind of putting a number to something that you have no idea, right. That you could ever put on there, but to the same extent, like, you're expecting life to like basically say, Oh, well, so Mike's got this three year plan. And I think what's going to happen is we're just going to move out of the way. We're going to allow life to go perfectly. We're never going to sick. We're never going to get hurt. We're never going to get stressed. 
we're going to keep things super easy for Mike because he's got this plan for three years, and he's going to go from 16 miles an hour on the bike to 20. Life doesn't give a shit. Life's like, we're going to do life, and you can do whatever hobby you want to do, but that's not how it works, right, as we've all seen, like, over the last year. Um, at the same time, right, and this isn't, like, a data or a graph that probably wants to go in, but, like, I'll, I'll use what we've been able to accomplish and be a part of the last five years of like, we couldn't have planned any of this. None of it. Mm -mm. Like if we, you know, when you were like, Hey, I think we should start a podcast. And my response was like, I don't even know what that is, but you know, tell me what to buy on Amazon and I'll, you know, get a $15 mic and we'll start doing whatever it is you say we're doing. Um, that was it. We didn't plan or expect anything. We started it because we loved it and we felt like we needed it as people, right. As, As humans, as friends, we needed, a connection. We felt like, Hey, there's probably more than likely other people out there too, that might need the same kind of thing that we feel like we need. But for the most part, we just did it because we liked it. It gave us a connection. We got to talk where we I was living in Kansas city. You were living in Nashville. We didn't have any other expectations except for we're going to commit to doing this twice a week Yeah, and we're going to be consistent and we're going to have fun. And some days we're going to want to love to do it. And some days we're going to not want to do it, but we're going to do it anyway. And we'll let's just see what happens. And then, you know, five years later, voila. You know, it's like you just, you can't predict and expect what might come. And, and you, but, and you will almost always fall short if it's not based out of love and, and things that are true, things that like, because you're just going to fall away. Like you see, like you see, athletes who get successful over a long period of time, like they're going to be the most successful version of themselves and probably better than ones that quit after year two, because it takes longer to get really, really, really good at anything. It takes years to get great at something. The people that quit want something overnight and they wanted it, not because they truly fell in love with just the process of wanting to get better. They just wanted it quick. Right. And if you can't deliver it quick, then I'm sorry, then I, I'm not interested in this, you know, mm-hmm. and like athletes will ask all the time, like, what kind of timeline can you do to expect to go from X to Z? I'm sorry, I don't do that. That's not that's something that I participate in because you don't have any idea. Neither do I. Um, and it's not about being un- uneducated or unexperienced. It's about being realistic. And it's about not setting the bar from expectations from a time or a data standpoint. It's about learning to love something and being a part of uh, not not just the community we have, but like the process of getting better, just part of who you are and what you do. Because if you can do that, then you're going to be able to navigate through the hard times of life and get to where you want to go. There's really no set trajectory because we're all made totally different. Mm -hmm. And all courses are different, all these kind of things. When I think about these kind of questions, the first thing that comes to my mind is like, how can I get faster? What's, what should I expect or whatever? And then uh, athletes will start looking at, top end speeds right they'll be like yeah i went out and i was on a flat and i you know i was going 26 and a half miles an hour on the bike and oh you know last year i could only do 25 and a half or whatever and then but to me or running is like my i I got below seven minute pace today coach and or whatever and i'm like you know for me the whole thing about being faster in the sport because these are long days for most of these, you know, we talk about halves or fulls. Those are long days. And it always comes down to control. How can you control your pace? Can you control your effort for a long, you know, extended periods of time? So, like, as you get into training, you start doing, like, 20-minute intervals on the, on the bike. And you can, by the third one, you're, you know, feeling as strong, if not stronger. That's when you know you're getting faster. But this whole idea is, like, you know, it's just about controlling yourself and controlling the race course and I, I I just think it's such a you know when you start looking at top end speed and thinking you're getting faster and stuff like that that's just so it's so deceptive sometimes to me because you know like when I know and I can go out and you know do like in the pool 500s and on 30 second rest or a minute rest and just clip them off you know by the you know sort towards the end of the training usually that's when I get into that space when I know that I and I don't like get exhausted and so I'm just like banging them out like banging them out like I was telling somebody the other day a lot of our athletes are uh you know this is a I think a triathlete kind of benchmark in a way it's like you you start swimming you know it's kind of like uh you know a thousand feels like a lot and then two thousand feels like a, a lot and then you get to that threshold where like you're doing your workouts and they're like 2300 24 25 
Well, when you break that 3,000 mark, that's when you're really getting somewhere. I think it, like when it feels like, oh, that wasn't that bad or that wasn't that big a deal. Psychologically, when you start hitting these bigger numbers as far as distance or interval lengths and things like that, that's when you're getting faster, like in the, in the, in the way that matters. You know what I mean? Because like we can go out and run, uh, you know, like fart licks and just blast it out. But can you hold that? Can you, sust- what, what pace can you sustain it? And I think that's, you know, the slower growth thing. But like you're saying earlier on the half marathon, it's like if you can start out at an 815 or a 730 or whatever and, and hold it as you increase your effort, that's when you know you're getting faster. But you know what I mean? It doesn't seem like you're getting faster. Mm-hmm. It's just you're getting stronger. And, and your ability to control your, yourself and your effort is like you, you're starting to own that space. That's really where the, the growth comes in the sport, in my opinion. And, and the thing is, it's just not, just not expecting it, right? It's like you know, going back to like what Adam said about chasing a pace or doing whatever. And like, I'll give you a great example. <clears throat> Last night, um, and I gave him a pass, Caleb, because he texted me after hours, but um, he never texts me. Um, he hadn't texted me since January, so I gave him a pass. Uh, but he said, hey, man, I don't text often since we, com- since we communicate in training peaks all week, but I just tackled the 5K. Uh, I, dro- I dropped a 5K time trial in for him on Wednesday, kind of out of nowhere, just because – he hasn't raced in forever. Um, and he has just, like a lot of people have. And I was like, well, just toss him there. Just kind of see, because again, like when you're, when you're process oriented, like we love for athletes to be, sometimes they don't get to see it. And we didn't taper or anything. He had like, he ran hard last weekend, and then ran Monday and Tuesday or, or had like a, a two days of fairly. That's not really a taper. And he said, um, anyway, I just tackled a 5k and I was not really feeling it. I was super anxious the whole day leading up to it. Warm up was warm up was subpar, and then I just jumped into my effort. My previous three mile PR was like nineteen thirty nine or something, and that was six to eight months ago. Came away with this one from a seventeen fifty one, and I am effing stoked. I can't thank you enough. So that's almost like a two minute difference on a five k, which is like insane. But thing is, he didn't ex- really expect or know what was going to happen. He just knew that he's basically missed like one workout in the last six or eight months. Yet mm-hmm. he got rewarded heavily, heavily. And the, that's the great part about not having expectations is that, like, it blew my Lord. He even said, he said, dude, I'm in such a good mood. I feel kind of blindsided. Um, that blindsided feeling is why training without so many tremendous expectations is so wonderful and so awesome because you don't expect it. Like, people consider, like, surprises and blindsides are, like, a bad thing. No. Because if you, expe- if you have these, like, insane expectations, with, which most people – pull out of nowhere or and they are frankly not in tune or in line with their level of time management or in their level of commitment and consistency surprises and being blindsided can be like a freaking good thing because you don't have any you just kind of have it. like i've used this analogy before back when i used to work for iron tribe fitness in kansas city people would pr all the time without even thinking about it like they would just be, they would just go in through their, their regular workout of the day. And they'd be like, dude, I just repped, you know, three thirty four four times. I've never even done it once. How'd that happen? And they're like, well, you've been coming four or five days a week for a few months. That's just kind of what happens. Like your body does that. And that's, that's the joy, right? And, and being process oriented and loving what you do and being consistent with it is that you can have and achieve all these wonderful things along the way. Because be, let's be honest, like, even if it is an expectation, Meeting it on the exact day at the exact time that you predict isn't going to happen. So even if you get fairly close, all your feeling is to be like, I got it. You know, like there it was on to the next one. You know, now I can't, why am I not getting any, you know, so it's just, it's a, it's a yeah. loaded. Yeah. It's loaded. That's um, interesting though. One quick thing on that iron tribe example. It's sort of like, for me, it's like uh, so much always mental. It's like either you can believe it, or you can get your mind out of the way. And if you can mm-hmm. let your mind get out of the way of something, that's when those surprises happen. Those, that's when I think you get blindsided. It's like you don't, you're not trying to hit certain things. You just, just let your body your move. Way. Get out of your own effing way. Mm-hmm. Clay Seal, when you're removed from previous reference points for pace, out of shape, long time since racing, how do you determine what those paces are during training? Example, I know what, I, what my... But I would like my 70.3 swim pace to be in what it has been in the past, but I don't know what it's right now, what it's shoot for. Pace is the most overused word in training. Stop thinking about pace. Think about effort. And 70.3 swim effort for most people should be like mid to high zone two. That's it. That's it. So whatever you feel like is your zone two, 
then that will equate to your pace, okay? Because if you hop in a river and swim upstream at zone two, your pace is going to be a lot different than if you hop in a river and you swim zone two downstream, right? Same thing can be said, same, same thing can be said for flat roads and hilly roads. Same thing can be said for 40 degrees or 85 degrees. Stop obsessing over pace. It's, it's, it, it's insanity, okay? It's obsessing tricky. over pace is insanity. It's tricky. Yeah, I've swam two 12s and one 15s. You know what I mean? It's like, I don't know. It, it does. It's so condition, you know, specific sometimes. And, and, and life specific. And the, and the 212 was harder, you right. know? Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's this like, effort. It's effort. Like your body knows effort. And, and it's just, it's something to wrap. We need to all better, do a better job of wrapping our brain around. We covered Jens. Uh, Michaela said, how do you plan your race calendar, spacing of events, distances? Always start with the sprint to shake out the racing jitters and how to race a race that isn't your A race. Um, and a loaded question, and I definitely know we have a um, we have a podcast like I think specifically geared towards race planning. In my opinion, race planning shouldn't be about picking races at all. It should be about picking the best time of your year to race. Um, we discuss it all the time, and like you know, people routinely pick a race in the middle of their absolutely most insane time of year, whether it's family, whether it's um, their kids, whether it's business, like, dude, I schedule a race and like, dude, I totally forgot. I always have like Q3 for me at work is insane. We're trying to meet all these sales goals. We have these conventions. I'm always traveling. Like, why did I pick this race? Because all you did was see the register button and you clicked. You had FOMO. Okay. You just clicked on it. You didn't look back. You didn't think like people just do that all the time. Or uh, every year someone bails on doing Chattanooga 70.3 or Gulf Coast because somehow they forgot their kid graduated high school. Okay. Like you don't think of life events. Like, and that's like the, the biggest problem with people when they sign up for races is that they, they, they generally don't think about like what is going to be conducive to the best time of year. Like, and I, I use this example to myself, like, and going back to your question, we'll have to cover as many as we can quickly. You don't have to do a sprint to dust the race off. Like, might not be available, right? You pick your you pick your main race of the year, and then you just see what might fit in around it. Whether it's you know four or five weeks out, that's also dependent. On, there's a lot of variabilities, and that's that's like a total podcast to go over. But like for me as an athlete and a coach, really the best times of year for me to race are March and April, okay, or October November. Anything any other time part of the year, I'm not going to probably be able to race my best because it's all about the athletes and all about going to races, being dialed in for athletes that are, you know, getting ready to perform in a race. It's about, and it, it also comes with like doing it for years. It's kind of knowing where your motivation goes and how much energy you have to do it. Um, so look at your life first, um, Michaela, and then kind of work your way backwards. Uh, Serena Bell, do you like flavored coffee? It depends. Heavily depends. Um, so yeah, it depends. Katie, if I'm going to make a hub visit to sharpen up before a full, what is the best time if the race is in early September, July, uh, July to early August is definitely the best time, Katie. Um, and you can shoot me a text if you want to discuss that further. John powers on race day. How do you balance power targets, hills and traffic and the dreaded drafting penalty risk? My fastest bike split ever was steelhead 2019. And while I knew I was blowing it up on the bike, I kept finding myself closing, on 10 plus bike pace lines where I had to choose between backing way off like two or three miles per hour or grabbing more gears and blowing up my legs. You know, that comes with practice. Um, but you know, you should always, I mean, it's not, in my opinion, it's not that hard to balance your power target because your power target should be a range. And it's not, it's not a range you have to stay in the entire time. It's a range you want to end in. Right. So if you, if your target power for the day is 200, to average and to have an average power of 200. I also, also give like a normalized power target to not go over because there are going to be example traffic, you know, coming out of turns, going up hills, you're going to go over 200. You just are right. That's just common. Like you, you shouldn't expect to be only at 200 the entire day. It's literally impossible. So you're going to have weight, but what you don't want is to have your normalized power to be so way off from your average power that your VI is like over 1.5 if it's a flat course or even like 1.08 for a hilly course. Um, so you got to give yourself a little bit of buffer and always look at where your normalized is in conjunction with your average power and kind of keep it as, as close as you can. But to the, to that same question, like 
it's also depending on where you are on the course. If you're 10 miles in, it's probably time to pass the pace line, right? If it's 10 miles out, then maybe your thought isn't, well, I'm having to slow down, but at the same time, like I can sit back, not in the pack, but I can sit back at a, at a legal distance and still get a huge benefit from these 10 bikes in front of me because that's just aerodynamics and how drafting works. I can still sit back, you know, four to five bike links and barely work and still get the transition, you know, maybe two minutes slower, but I'll be so fresh because I've done so much less work. That's when you have to kind of think, oh, well, then I can rip it on the run. Um, but that's not, that's not a decision you want to make it like mile five, right? Or mile 10. That's something you kind of have to kind of troubleshoot and you have to know yourself and know your effort, but the, you never want to think I'm blowing myself up, right? Because if you're doing that, then you're going to be burnt for the run. You're going to be burnt for the rest of the day. Agree. <sighs> Next up quickly, Josh, since a lot of athletes are racing the upcoming 70.3 in chat, describe the best approach the bike course conservative for the first 30 miles and lift the effort on the back half. It's not hilly. This is a super fast bike course, in my opinion. Like, people way overestimate. If you've even, like, trained remotely well, this is not a hilly course. It has one little pincher, but that's it. I think it's a screamer of a bike course. I mean, it's not like a Muncie or an Ohio where it's, like, pancake flat, but it's just like the full. I mean, we have, I think you're included. Like, your fastest Ironman bike split is Ironman Chattanooga, and it's four miles longer. Like, it is a very, very, very fast bike course. Um you know, I always, I know, I don't see like, you know, go conservative, you know, you never want to be conservative. You just want to be smart for the first 40 miles of every course, no matter what it is. Um, you know, terrain aside, you want to be able to decide on your own if you want to lift the pace or if or not have the decision made for you by the train, whether it's super easy or super not. So, um, no, you stay within your power target in the last 15 to 10 miles of a 70.3. If you think you have the, the legs to up it some, then up it some. But always ask yourself, Will this help or hurt my run? And nine times out of 10, the answer is, and eh, it's probably not worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you want to give yourself to a mile 40, 45 to even ask that question. Whew. A lot of talking today. I agree with that, man. You There's, agree? I mean, Could, this, said, this course is... Couldn't have said it better myself. Couldn't have said it better myself. The, the course here isn't... Uh, anything devastating but it there's a lot of rollers out there and i think it's a for me it's a lot about just being in the right gear and going over the top of these things with under control and and taking advantage of the downhills because it can be fast momentum yep let's see if i can hit the rest of these super quick we're running out of time yeah you're running away at a time i do want to touch yeah i'm gonna touch one more um we may go back to these um it's definitely not covering the nba playing tournament um, Wes Keen, how do you get back? How do you get back going after burnout? Uh, and I think it's a great question. I think we we mentioned this like is a that little, a personal question? Wes? We, we 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 mentioned that <laughs> briefly. I think a couple of podcasts ago when um we talked about how, and I'll go back to the quote that Daniela Reef had in her article that we that we referenced, uh, and it was something to the effect of you know burnout is all about getting too close to the flame. Right. And the flame could be your expectations. It could be unrealistic goals for most athletes. Your fire that you got close to is other people. And the, and the, the thief of joy is comparison. And and most people's fire that they get too close to that, that allows them to get burnt out is expectation, right? Scrolling through Facebook, throwing, scrolling through Strava, scrolling through Instagram, scrolling through whatever it is and seeing other people's lives and other people's abilities and other people's, reference points and other people's, you know, agendas and then saying, I should be able to do that. And if I can't do that, then I'm just not good enough Mm -hmm. because then everything you do is not, is not good enough. Right. And that is a very negative, unhealthy, unbalanced perspective to have that will ultimately rob you and you will get too close to the fire and then you are getting burned out. So I think that's always the case of that's always the first question you should ask yourself when you're coming back from burnout is why did I get too close to the fire and what fire was it? Right. To learn your lesson of, of because that'll help you get back, right. To get back to finding the, the joy and, and the peace and the, you know, the, enjoy, the, the, the fire, the good kind of fire, right. That's lit in you to like want to have fun and want to get better because listen, that's, that's the world we live in is comparison, comparison, comparison. And it's, it's a, it's a horrible, horrific, lose-lose game to play for everybody is to, is to compare 
um, it's also incredibly, it can be not just frustrating, but it can prevent you from becoming the best at what you want to become the best at. And I think that's, that's a hard cause everyone likes, you know, we have this discussion all the time, like everyone likes to look at things in black and white because it's easy to wrap their brain around because it's been replicated. Like so-and-so does this. So I should be able to do so-and-so this and I should, that's not life, right? Like life is fun in the gray. I can tell you that because gray is my favorite color, but life is fun in the gray. And just because other people want to do things or not do things like that's on them. That's not on you, right? You live your own life. You make your own expectations. You are not, not expectations. You make your own goals and you make your own an expectation is the word I'm looking for. You make your own, you find your own fulfillment, right? But in order to have or really know what that fulfillment is, you have to know what, what really, how that's going to happen, how that's going to progress. Um, and a lot of people it's, it's finding the right balance, right? Because I'll tell you, like I, I've worked with athletes in the past and, and that's something that, you know, we pride ourselves on now is like, if you're becoming the best, going back to the very beginning of the podcast, people trying to get better at triathlon and at life. Cause I know a lot of people, um, not that I work with cause we, we won't stand for it to be honest with you. Um, that are only concerned with getting better at triathlon have no desire at being better at anything else in life, better friends, better at work, better at home. Like they will sacrifice being a good parent for being a better triathlete. And that's, that's when you get, you know, your, your expectations and your desires misplaced and that's no longer being fulfilled. That is, you know, trying to achieve something that is, is counterproductive in my opinion. So, you know, the, the biggest thing is finding why you got too close. And then, and then honestly, whose fire was it? Was it because a lot of people get burnt out on other people's fires because that's what they think they should achieve and do. And they search for this, this feeling and this thought to feel, you know, better or to feel like an athlete or to, or that they're, they are a good, you know, what a good triathlete or the, whatever it is, like every story is our own. Right. And that, I think that's taking ownership of that and then not giving an F what other people think is a skill that I think everyone should have in life. I'm going to go on the back of that metaphor and just because I've, I don't want to say I was burnt out, but I've, I've had a lot of struggles and just to throw this out Wes is like, I just, I wonder if maybe, uh, cause what's happened to me is I just sort of like turned my focus to the water and the pool and, you know, maybe there's something there about putting out a fire or like that and getting too close, maybe cooling down or something, because there's something about just, uh, the last three weeks or so of me getting in there and just thinking about water and swimming and, and how that does my body. Right. And it's just sort of slowly ignited the desires to run and, and ride a little more. So that could be something, I don't know how long it's been since you hit the pool very frequently, but um, there's something about it, man. There's something about just jumping in the water that kind of brings you awake a little bit more. And it just, it's just like a feel good thing for me. So that could be something to try. Well, we'll end on that one. All there's right. a couple more. We'll see if we, I'm sure people will be posting this all day. Maybe we'll use it for next Monday's cast. Um, that's it. That's all we got. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Hope you got something out of it. Again, if you uh, feel like you like you missed out and you got left out, hop into our Facebook group, Crushing Iron Group. Uh, answer one simple question, we'll let you write in. Uh, <laughs> you got into serious voice there. I know it's like my that's like, my serious. You know. Yeah, well, I mean, I have to be serious like at some point, like in some stages Just, of life, because you know that I'm <laughs> rarely ever serious. Um, which people think is the opposite. People think I think I'm like too serious, but I'm not. I'm pretty laid back. Wouldn't you say? How would you describe me? Um, careful. I would say, you know, very focused, but very flexible on the, you know, fuck around. <laughs> Flex. That's my new shirt. Flexible. Coach Robbie and Coach Robbie in the front, and the back, in quotes. I'm flexible in the fuck around, like that is like yeah. <laughs> I'm focused, but it's life, baby. Like you enjoy That's yourself. Good it, it is pretty uh, accurate. Don't I don't know I mean, if it's you know, explicit lyrics, but yeah, it's uh, yeah. yeah. We get more lessons when it's explicit. <laughs> Do we? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, well, but we at least warn you. Look on the um, warnings. Yeah, now that you're an hour and forty five <laughs> seconds in, <laughs> it's too late. Anyway, uh, if you want to see what all the other things we're doing, the hub uh, coming in and seeing us, we have a lot of people coming in right now. Like in the next two or three months, to take advantage of our 
uh, hub experience and condo package. Basically, for four hundred and seventy-five bucks, you get a you get a four or five hour visit here at the hub with us to go through all things triathlon, um, swim, bike, and run analysis, testing zones, all the stuff to set you up for a great a great season, a great race. Um, and also includes a uh, one night in our condo, which is like fifty steps away. Chenning is an awesome place. If you're coming in town, you want to be a part of that, or you're just coming in town in general, checking out the course, or want to do stuff for the family. Uh, more info on that and all of our camps and any gear. Uh, that is c26 operations at gmail.com. If you have any questions for Mike specifically about coaching or any other parts of his greatness, he is at crushing iron at gmail.com. Or if you have any uh, questions for me specifically and about my flexibility to fucking around, you can email me directly at c26 coach at gmail.com. Oh, we're going to get it. We're going to go on probation. Aren't we? Oh, yeah. iTunes. Yeah, maybe edit that one. Not out. iTunes. Who's going to put us on probation then? Certain your mom, parents. Oh, yeah. my mom. My mom's too busy trying to buy a house right now. She doesn't have time to listen to podcasts. No, my mom would be fine. I think it's yeah. just uh, some people. I mean, some maybe. other people. That's fine. Might not some like people it. don't like us already. I know. Please don't email us. <laughs> Please don't. about that. Listen, we love you. Okay, we honestly do. But you know, we love ourselves too. That's okay. It's it's words. It's a word. It's word, and words have meaning just like we hope this podcast did and we hope to see you all eventually someday <laughs> and <laughs> clothes just frayed apart I we're know. going so strong we're close. Yeah, let's we're close, close it out man let's close it out alright dude I'll see you next week alright see ya.